students to succeed in these classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like uh, some of this is driven by the kind of notion of the achievement gap and the yeah. reduction of the achievement gap. Um, and there, of course, the main way we hope we hope to close the achievement ba a gap is by raising up the performance mm -hmm. of low income students and students of color. But there's the also kind of the perverse way to close the achievement gap, which is by dragging down high performing students. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it's going the, the goal of this and, and this proposal is to take that second route there and kind of lower the standard when in reality we should be elevating students. Mm -hmm. When I was a tutor, uh, a private tutor, I used to joke with my friends that I was doing my part to reduce the achievement gap by <laughs> giving the rich kids the wrong answers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but just for everyone out there, that was a joke. And I gave all the, all the kids the right answers, <laughs> regardless of socioeconomic status. Right. <laughs> so what has been the pushback uh, to these pr proposed changes? So I think the first thing it's important to note is as a proposal, it's not going to be implemented automatically in every school in California. I think it's up to the district whether or not they would like to implement this. But I think the big change is, number one, it's not entirely logical. <laughs> like I mm -hmm. mentioned before, um, these school these courses that are being de-emphasized are really the foundations for the their suggested replacement. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, it's not helping the cause for equity like we were just discussing. And I think too, thinking about going back to what is the goal of education, what is the goal of learning such math courses and STEM courses, um, calculus is foundational to so many other STEM courses. And thinking about giving calculus students in high school is really a stronger idea than doing it in college because I think, number one, it can help with a major selection in college if you're exposed to it early and you're like, you know what, this is something that I really enjoy um, or something that I feel really confident or proud of myself for understanding, that can then lead to choosing a career in STEM, which we know has is really a marketable skill in today's day and age, number one, and number two, has high earning potential if we are hoping to close the achievement gap and produce social mobility. Um, I think, too, uh, another piece of the pushback is that there's a lack, uh, there's a potential for a lack of recognition of students' talents and aptitudes. Um, there's no, not as much room for celebrating a mastery of difficult content, which mm -hmm. we know that these higher level STEM courses are quite challenging. And so when students who maybe previously thought that they weren't qualified to take such a class or that they were down on themselves, um, they're not, we're not giving them the chance to succeed and feeling that sense of pride and that sense of confidence that they get from being academically successful. Um, I was a high school teacher and seeing the confidence that could be instilled in students by them personally um, understanding or grasping or grappling with content that, you know, is hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was an English teacher, but I saw students who were reading Shakespeare being like, whoa, like we're reading Shakespeare because you've heard that this is hard stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, from your older siblings or from older peers that this is something that's kind of like a rite of passage almost. And you know, I mean, the purpose is to struggle and to understand it and access it. You don't really learn if you're not being challenged. And I think too with these, uh, it, it allows students to advocate for themselves a little more. It allows students to seek out resources outside of class or attend office hours, which are skills that are needed with college persistence. So if going back to the goal of this, which is equity and closing the achievement gap, I stand by my initial statement <laughs> that it is not doing as much good as it sets out to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And a lot of times policy, especially education policy debates, there's kind of like a equity argument on one side and the other side is arguing for something else, whether it be you know a funding thing or some sort of of political cause, but this this uh, the debate over this really seems to be both sides arguing for equity in different ways. Yeah, I think it's interesting as well because so much in education is politicized these days, and mm -hmm. you kind of think of math as this like pretty objective subject. It's not like English where we're thinking about which authors are we going to read or history, which which viewpoints are we going to read. I think or study. I think with math, the kind of common notion is okay, we're all learning the same shapes and the same angles and the same equations. But it's interesting to me that this is becoming somewhat subjective and politicized now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be learning the right angles and you'll be learning the wrong angles, perhaps. <laughs> um, so another part of this framework, besides the kind of the the big, the most controversial thing, was this kind of the tracking and the tracking order of the grades. But there's also a part about uh, imp uh, you know, installing a more culturally responsive pedagogy in mathematics. So what is what do they mean by that? Yeah, so culturally responsive pedagogy, I think, would be a nice alternative to implementing this framework. And when thinking about culturally responsive uh, pedagogy, that's really thinking about who are the students who are in the classroom doing the learning and how can we access them and how mm -hmm. are they going to be most receptive and responsive. So that's kind of going back to what I was saying about, um, you know, thinking about in an English class, students see themselves in the character who they're reading about, or they have diverse perspectives, or they are not only reading white European men who are the authors here. Mm -hmm. 
So in a math class, you might be thinking about, okay, if I have a word problem, what are the names being used? Are they Mm -hmm. going to uh, the bodega or are they going to the store, right? Little pieces of cultural um, jargon that might speak more to students depending on a given background or a a given location or a given area and just making them see themselves reflected in the material. So they might have an increased sense of belonging in that classroom, which might then result in increased engagement in the class, um, might make them more incentivized to participate, might make them more willing to take a risk in that class, which will pay off in terms of grades, in terms of investment in school, and just in terms of wanting to continue to succeed in school. Mm -hmm. Does this play at all? Because I know one of the big uh, complaints uh, from students in math classes is like, why are we learning this? I'm never going to use this. Um, like this is pointless. Does this does this kind of speak to that concern as well? Yeah, I think it helps with the investment piece for sure. I think if they see um, that there is a place for it in their own lives, then absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you think having this sort of math uh, electives proposed in the framework, not necessarily as the standard path, but as a um, elective might be a productive? Yeah, I think it, if it supplements these traditional math pathways, then absolutely. I do think it is important that current curricula and the current sequence of uh, classes is being considered because schools were established hundreds of years ago, and I'm not Mm -hmm. sure that they have evolved commensurately with the evolving population in this country. And so I think the fact that this is a topic of conversation is wonderful and is correct, just I'm not sure if the actual proposal is outlining the proper next steps. Mm -hmm. It seems because when by, you know, dropping calculus or statistics as a requirement, um, it seems like it's kind of kicking the equity can down the road in certain ways. Because if these students end up at college, they're going to have to take calculus and statistics anyway, and you're putting your students at a disadvantage. Um, because sometimes the policy I've seen seems to think that the students that they're focused on are the only students in the world, and like the labor market is only them. But in mm-hmm. reality, when you're educating students in California, they're not just competing against students in California; they're competing against students in every other state and across the world. So yeah. to to lower the achievement gap in California, but to lower everyone's performance is really doing everyone a disservice. I do find a bit of irony in the fact that this takes place in California as well, because Mm -hmm. as we know, that's the home of Silicon Valley. It's the home of so much technological innovation. And if students there aren't getting the STEM education that they might otherwise, then they might not be inclined to stay in California and return to those jobs that that exist in Silicon Valley or elsewhere. Um, And so by really ensuring that there is this really foundational STEM education, I I think is super important. Mm -hmm. And we know that the California um, college system is so robust and keeping that talent in state, I think, can have really strong returns for that state where the achievement gap is so large. so by focusing on strengthening that rather than totally changing it, I think would would go a long way. Yeah, the desire to keep students in a, in the public school setting, I think, would probably also be benefited. Because has there been talk of what would happen to more affluent families, whether they would leave the public school districts if these were implemented? Not that I've seen. There might... There might have been, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I think, again, it's important to understand that it's not necessarily being adopted widely. It's just a proposal, it's, and mm-hmm. schools can adopt it on as they would like. I'm not sure if school boards would have any involvement in or, or say in that. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't find this proposal to be particularly um, relevant or effective. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. There you have it, everyone. Allison Swimmer votes no on the California Mathematical (laughs) Framework. Thanks for having me, Sam. (laughs) Lastly, for today, we have School Days, where we interview a guest about their own personal educational journey, the schools they went to, the experiences they had, and how that impacts where they are now. Today, to celebrate the end of our first season as a podcast, we have a very special School Days. This season, we have globetrotted our way around the education world, learning about schools from California to Florida, Mexico to Ireland. So now we're going to bring it close to home. And I, Sam Zuckert, your loyal host, will share with you my own personal school day's experience. For me, it all started in Evanston, Illinois, a city of about 75,000 people that border Chicago to the north, located about 10 miles north of the loop. My family lived in the southeast corner of Evanston, Um, right by Elks Park and in between South Boulevard and Howard on the Purple Line, if you're familiar with the L. And if you're not, um, look it up. It's on Google. Anyway, we, we lived in the southeast corner, and the closest elementary school to my house was actually Oakton Elementary School. But due to um, 
a busing program in order to desegregate Evanston Elementary Schools. My family was actually zoned for Lincoln Elementary School. Now, Evanston has a long and complex racial history. It's a fairly diverse town, but it's also a segregated town uh, racially and economically in many ways. Um, In the 60s, the school zone map were kind of explicitly drawn to segregate students by race. Um, You know, some people may argue that it was just naturally by neighborhoods, um, but due to, you know, the historic um, housing segregation laws and practices in America, they kind of ended up being one and the same. So in the 60s, Evanston changed the school zone maps and started busing kids around the city in order to desegregate the schools. And that uh, effort continued up until present day, really. And my, my family... As a result, we lived in a neighborhood that was more diverse than Evanston as a whole. And so we were bused to Lincoln Elementary School, which is in, um, which closer to the lake in a nice, uh, a ni- pretty nice neighborhood in Evanston. Um, so that was an interesting way to start, how it was always those kind of dynamics of the social dynamics of a school district were kind of always present uh, to me and everyone at my school. Um, it was a pretty progressive school. It was racially diverse, economically diverse, and they really wanted to make, um, you know, I think make everyone feel welcome and make everyone feel like we were, um, you know, learning the right things for the right reasons. We would have um, marches, civil rights marches, uh, every every year during Black History Month. They would, um, to start off the month, they would gather us all in the auditorium and they would play Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And we would sit there and watch it every year. And we would do, um, you know, make protest signs and do a march around the school. But it was a school that had a lot of consistency. Most of the teachers, you know, had been there for years, if not decades. There was one fifth grade teacher, Miss Cohen, I believe, who actually taught my mom at Hebrew school. And it was just that kind of atmosphere. It was a very family, family atmosphere. Pretty much everyone had an older sibling or a younger sibling who attended, if not a parent who had attended. Um, and so everyone kind of came in knowing people and everyone... Um, was friendly. I mean, there was obviously the, the same kind of um, trouble you get at any other school when you have all those children mixed together. But, you know, it really felt like a, a place that families went and stayed for years. Well, not a lot of people came and not a lot of people left. It was a pretty constant class. And they had a lot of community-wide events too. I remember they did a good job trying to mix the grades and get people together. They had um, the hobby fair every year, the fifth grade. The fifth graders had all these fairs and they would get to set up projects for the rest of the school. So the fifth grade had the hobby fair where every fifth grader would you know, bring in their hobby and make a poster board and share it. And then the rest of the school would come in. So one day there was the hobby fair and then every class, all the kindergartners and first and second and third graders would come and look. And all as a fifth grader, you would like, you know, show everyone your hobby and talk to all these first graders and second graders and the parents come. And similarly, we had a colonial fair where everyone would dress up like we were in colonial Williamsburg and we would present to the whole school about what it was like to live in colonial America. Now for a racially diverse school, um, I think they kind of just ignored any potential racial issues with colonial America, um, which may have been for the best. That would have been complicated. And we were covering that, that in other other fields. So perhaps that was that. So for me, my own experience, I was a fairly precocious child. Um, I would badger my teachers with answers to questions and questions to answers. Um, I remember in first grade, the teacher had this like big, big bucket of of plastic eggs, like Easter eggs that had little trivia questions inside. And when we did good in on like worksheets or something, or if we finished early, we could go get an Easter egg. And if we submit, if we got the trivia question, we would get a treat or something. And I would just blaze through worksheets and absolutely demolish trivia questions uh, to the point where she was quite irritated with me and put a limit on my trivia activity. Um, And similarly, we had these math fact sheets. I remember it was like addition or subtraction sheets, like 40 problems. And the teacher would do them with us. She would give us all the sheets. She'd be like, all right, flip it over. Let's do the addition. And if you did the sheet faster than her, or if you finished the sheet in the time it took her to finish the sheet and then grade her own, check her own answers, then you got a king size candy bar, which was huge. Now, I don't know if anyone's, if y'all have seen a king size candy bar recently, but I mean, even for a full grown adult, they're massive. They're massive candy bars. They're like 12 ounces of chocolate and sugar. It's too much candy for one person. Um, And in first grade, I was like half of the size of of what I am now. 
Um, so it would be like eating three pounds of sugar or something. Anyway, I wanted that candy bar and we all wanted that candy bar. Um, but the teacher was fast in math facts, but, but lucky for me, I too was fast.